All right. Well, thanks for joining everyone. Um, Thursday evening, it's uh, November 2nd already. Gosh, November 2nd. So yeah. Uh, so Ray, on that, there's another case I was helping this woman with and she she just ran with it. After I helped her in a show with basic procedure, uh, her attorney charged like $200,000 to uh, in the end after seven years. And it was a case that could have been won with one letter. This is how it goes. One letter. And she didn't know that. She's like, ah, you know, I'm I got an attorney now. And then she realized $200,000 later. So she fired the attorney. She has a malpractice claim against him. That's unusual. Usually you just have a bar complaint, but this one, this is malpractice. The attorney said, you can't beat the DOJ. She beat him on most of the counts and the other counts, she's appealing it. And the case law is in her favor. And I think that they just hope that and bet that you don't know how to do the procedure. And maybe they forgot that we have the public school system. And in spite of all their efforts, we somehow learn to read. <laughs> it's not that hard. 200,000 to an attorney? Yeah. I would have stopped at like 25, but, you know, that's what they do. They just drag it out forever. And so he confessed that he wasn't, he says they'll, they'll always win. And I'm thinking, well, why the hell did you even take the case if you're incompetent? You're admitting you're incompetent after receiving $200,000. And that's what they do. So, and the reason why I include this snippet here is just because it's it's really part of our conversation today. Yes. So I want to I want to share with y'all uh, some uh, some things that I'm working on, and I want to announce uh, our new series here. But before I do, so well, I, anyways, I guess while I'm doing that, I'm just going to mention I'm going to be talking about privacyfight.io. We have this new subscription called Divorcing the State, and I just recommend that you look at that because I'm not saying you should go get divorced. This is not what it's about. It's about explaining why the state court system, all family courts cannot do what they're doing. They cannot interfere with the marriage because simply um, no court can create a contract and make people comply with it. No court can interfere with a contract. Judges can decide if a certain provision should be done a certain way or can penalize somebody or award a judgment for breach of contract in that nature, but the court can't get in there and start coercing a contract, for example, is what they do in, in family court. And there's a divorce petition or separation proceeding or child custody proceeding. You can do some of those separately. Um, and, and moreover, even if the court comes up with, like, if you look at any divorce decree, I'm sorry to say this if you've already gone through this before, but if you already w have gone through this before, you should know that the divorce decree is not valid, not one single line of it, because if you fail to comply with any particular provision, you're possibly held in contempt of court. So that, by definition, is an agreement entered into by duress. And it's a definition of the court imposing a contractual term on you. So I want to get into that. But um, look at privacyfight.io. And you can also look at crypticaccounting.com. And of course, aceofcoins.com is my home site. Most of my content is on Privacy Fight on YouTube. Now, sometimes I publish it, I'm starting to publish it on Brighteon. So I'll, I'll talk more about that as I develop that website. But anyways, this evening, I wanted to talk about the, um, the uh, jurisdictional aspects of uh, the family court. And it's not so much that I think everybody should be, you know, learning Can all I this, say John? That it's important to understand the language and, and point out things that are so obvious that we never even think about before. Marriage is a contract. It's a very special contract. It's based on vows and it, is, it creates a private membership association. <laughs> What's that? Right? So you've got a private membership association. Ray's got his hand up. You want to say something? Yeah, people are, don't have their phones muted and they're blocking what you're saying. There's two people that are not muted, Cynthia like and Eddie. All. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. If that's happening. Um, you guys want to get into some chat. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll do it sometimes. I get carried away. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> all right. You guys are funny. Uh, so this, this idea uh, that uh, you can go to the court and complain about your spouse. What are you doing? You already have a court. It's called a marriage. Matters should be settled, okay? And you should do the right thing. If a person wants to leave the marriage, then 
there should be arrangements. In fact, it should be part of the arrangement ongoing. It should be, anyways, this is not how we learned it to to carry out our marriages. We just, uh, you know, fill out a form and stand in line and then say, yeah, and I do. And then we think life is great and it goes forward. But no, we actually have a big duty. It's a, it's a, it's a big responsibility to manage that uh, agreement. And if you want to do it for life, you know, that's, that's a big responsibility. So in any case, we go to the court, we ask the court to intervene. Hey, jurisdiction cannot be conferred on the court by agreement. There's your case law right there. Okay, if you want to look that up, jurisdiction cannot be conferred by agreement. That precludes the, the divorce uh, court, family court, separation proceedings, child custody proceedings. That precludes the judges from getting involved. It also precludes arbitration. But arbitration is a, an, an election by the parties. And I don't want to get too far into that. But the thing I want to talk about tonight is that in in a family court proceeding, there in, it's involved, it's based on a marriage. And husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, if you live together and you have the same beneficial interests and one party relies upon another or vice versa, this is uh, this is the definition of marriage. Okay, you may not call it that, but it is. And that's how the court looks at it. Family court jurisdiction, the way it operates right now, is based on residency. It doesn't matter if you paid a marriage license, paid for a marriage license. If you are a resident, and you have this arrangement, this living arrangement, the court will gladly take jurisdiction, okay? And I think that the underbelly of this, the, the ugly part of this is that every once in a while, the court gets the child protective services involved and they can get custody of your children. I think that's really what's happening. The numbers increase when you have family court for one reason or another. It creates a likelihood. It's not so obvious to everyone looking on. So in any case, a marriage is an agreement and okay, so it's not in writing. So what I do is I look at, I interview the person I'm working with and I create or reverse engineer the agreement, but the agreement is based on a trust. So the trust is where, and I'm just going to say the husband, the father is the trustee. It, it doesn't have to be, but it, it, it probably should be and is most of the time. Okay. But this is ignored. The marriage agreement is ignored. The first thing that happens in a divorce proceeding is there's discovery of assets and the court starts saying, do this with your assets, reallocate everything. Wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There was already an agreement for this. We already had a child custody agreement. One of us drove the children to school every day. Uh, one of us uh, was responsible for taking them out and getting them clothing. Uh, someone else paid for that or we both paid for it, whatever. Whatever you were doing in the marriage, in the, in the living arrangement, that's the agreement. And because you didn't have it in writing, so what? It's never discovered. They just ignore all that. And the court says, you're going to do the following. And these terms are arbitrary and they come from the state legislature. And the judge is deprived of his, I shouldn't say deprived, but as a matter of law, he doesn't have the discretion. He or she does not have the discretion to be a judge. He has to do what the state said, the legislature. It's bad. How can a, a corporation tell you how to, how to manage your uh, marriage and also reallocate or allocate its resources, the money, the property and so forth. So the first thing I do in a case is I, as I challenge the court's jurisdiction because the court cannot be used to change a contract. That's number one. And um, then we get into the issue of you want to divvy up the property in the, in the marital community. Well, there isn't any. Why? Well, because I said so. What? That doesn't make any sense. Well, if I tell the court, if I inform the court by declaration of trust and I explain that all the chattels in the household, all the things the court would divvy up cash, precious metals, furniture, vehicles, all these things that make the house comfortable and convenient, okay, the household for the people that live there, the family. It could be just husband and wife. They could also involve children. That is all held in trust for their benefit. So if one of the spouses leave and wants another arrangement, that's a breach of the trust. That's an, an attempt to use the court to pillage the trust to take the marital assets for and allocate them or reallocate them for a, a purpose other than what was already agreed upon. And it's done under penalty of contempt, which is a police function of the judicial branch of government. It's where the court can put the person in jail or impose fines or that thinks it can for a failure to comply with the court's order. And the court's order is void and one of the aspects I look at is, let's say you already have an agreement. Let's say you already have a divorce decree. Let's, let's say it's not fair because you're not going to care otherwise. But if it's not fair, the first thing is don't comply. 
what don't comply don't don't pay child support well don't do it the way the court says don't pay child support if you're paying child support why don't you just take custody of the children why did why is the custody removed and then you have to pay for it so it's unfair in that case but this is a reallocation of resources this is imposing the court's will which it doesn't have by the way but imposing the court's will the court is an insane person it's a creature without a conscience you just have to call it like it is and so what the heck is the court doing showing up in your living room and telling you what to watch on tv at night that's essentially what it's doing and people think that's okay why do they think so well i think it's because they're watching tv and all these shows that involve those scenarios are teaching us what we should expect what we should tolerate and so we think it's normal file a divorce petition in the court divorce 99 dollars. uncontested divorce 99 dollars. i see these signs on the road all the time so it's important to understand where the court would have jurisdiction it would have jurisdiction if there's evidence of abuse or neglect right and possibly child protective services as well but that has to be established and the circuit court or your state superior court your trial court like in New York, it's the Supreme Court. That's your trial court. In California, Superior Court, Florida Circuit Court, uh, I think Georgia Circuit Court, uh, that has uh, jurisdiction over contract disputes. But it, it, it has jurisdiction, the criminal court has jurisdiction over situations where someone's being injured, abused, or neglected, okay? And we already have the, the system in place for that. But what happened is, I think the court system saw an opportunity just like any other business and franchised itself, created a franchise co called family court, the family court division. You ever see that? So you would attack the divorce decree stating with an affidavit that the decree is, is, was entered into under duress by threats and by means of coercion. So it's not valid and not one of them is valid ever. So that's two, two jurisdictional problems they cannot overcome. And there's plenty of case law on that. I'm not inventing something here. You know, splitting up property, making one party go into debt to borrow the equity out of the house and give half to the spouse. This is wrong. You know, this is creating a, 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 a financial hardship for one party. And I believe it's done, as you can imagine, to destroy the family. So this is the language uh, that I, that I use and, uh, they don't like to hear that. And uh, what I'm finding is, and I can show you guys how to do this. I had a conversation today with a, 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 a similar case, but I, what I'm finding is that we can just remove the judge's immunity, you know, and there's all these people talking about things you file in the court and, and there are all these theories about the money system and the bonds and all this stuff. And, and I, I would agree with most of that, but it, it's not that complicated. Okay. So if a judge is going to act outside of his mandate, then his his immunity needs to be removed and it's not removed automatically so there's a process by which you can remove his immunity and it's very fast you send one letter sometimes to the attorney general's office expressing a tort that's how you do it and then the judge is a private citizen he's no longer insured he's not bonded he's acting on his own and he's personally liable for the damages that that follow so you put him on notice he doesn't do the right thing. You file the proper motions, doesn't do the right thing. Then you remove his immunity. So these are these uh, cases I'm, I'm telling you about that. I've got a you know half dozen or so, and they're fairly new, but uh, they're, they're starting to wake up and realize, okay, yeah, marriage is a contract. And yeah, the court is being used to change the contract. And because the parties don't understand that, uh, the court proceeds. And the way the court gets away with it is by inducing an agreement. Um, which is known as alimony, child support, and custody. That changes or reallocates the resources uh, differently than they were already allocated other than what the parents decided. The parents figured it out. They figured out how they're going to pay for stuff. And now the court comes in there like a bull in a china shop and starts dictating things. S tell me when that ever happens if I have a partnership agreement with somebody in business and we're going along just fine and then all of a sudden I decide I should change a couple material aspects to the contract, well, who do I deal with? The other partners, right? So I go talk to the other partners and they say, nah, John, you're full of it. 
We don't want to do it that way. We think it's great the way it is. We don't want to make any changes. So if I don't like that, I don't, my remedy is not to go to the court and say, Hey judge, change this contract for me. But that's what's happening in every single divorce case. Now I can go to the court and say, there's a breach of contract. I'd have to prove it. And the court, the court can do something, you know, the court is supposed to preserve the status quo. And that's what family court tells you. We're here to preserve the status quo. First of all, the state doesn't have a compelling interest in your marriage. It has a compelling interest if there's a crime, but not just fat by the fact that one of the spouses wants to go to the court and get the court to intervene. So here's my typical case. I'm not saying this always works out that way. I know I sound biased, but I'm just going to tell you the wife wants to leave. So the husband, you know, he already has allocated how resources are, are to be managed. She doesn't like it for some reason. She can't get his agreement. She leaves. She goes, gets strangers, gangs up on the husband and tries to pillage the trust to change that arrangement, forcing him against his will under penalty of being imprisoned if he doesn't do it and public humiliation and all those things that go with it. Because if you get if you get imprisoned on an order of contempt, you get your mugshot and everything else and good luck you know, trying to go forward in society after that. It's going to ruin your credit and everything. It's humiliating. Um, not that I've been through it, but I've seen many cases um, where, where that's involved. Uh, so anyways... What I I want to look at the uh, the notes here. What I wanted to uh, start out the call tonight with was that little explanation. That's what's going on, and I believe that the the charters, the sets of rules for family court, they have a subdivision of rules. Let's call that a charter, mission statement, or whatever. That should be dissolved, and people can work things out. Now I suggest that people work things out, and if you don't know how, guess what? They already have pretty good rules of procedure to follow. You can work things out. Okay, we we're a civil society. And if you need some guidance, there's no problem getting an arbitrator to help you with standard practices. So like for legal rights and things like that, it's okay to confer with somebody. But really, your marriage is a private membership association, just like the court is. Um, a marriage is, I would just say, it's exactly legally like a church. The marriage is a church, okay? So is the court. They'll never admit that, though. But the court is an ecclesiastical society. It's a forum. Um, and they, they want to have power over what your, what your uh, marriage is. Now in the marriage, you've got the husband and wife, that's a private membership association. And then you've got the husband and wife and the children. That's a separate private membership association. There's a trust relationship where the manage the ma management of the marriage, let's say the, the husband, the father earns the money and allocates it. How is agreed upon husband and wife, right? Uh, that is a trust making the, uh, wife and the children, the beneficiaries, right? So imagine the wife goes and gets a gang of attorneys or one attorney and gangs up against the husband and brings the court in there. So now you got the power of contempt, right? And then you come into the court and explain, wait a minute, judge, first of all, you don't have jurisdiction, but let's say you think you do have jurisdiction. Let's say that you did. There's nothing in the marital community. Moreover, the things that she is wanting to change in the marital community, she's already benefiting from completely. So how can I be compelled to do something, give her something when she already has the use of it. She's the beneficiary of the trust. And who are you, by the way? Right? So there's no there's no controversy over which the court can take jurisdiction. That's another jurisdictional issue. There's no justiciable controversy. There can't be. How can you have a marriage when every body of law, every statute, every chapter in your state statutes sees a husband and wife as one. I mean, if I try to get charging order protection in an LLC with two, with a husband and wife, it's seen as one person. So, but how's that change when there's a divorce petition? What, they have a different set of rules and laws? No, the, the, the same rules apply. Elaine, did you want to ask something? It's okay. Well, this sounds great, but the court has the power to call the police and have you arrested if you don't comply. So what how do you how do you fight that? Well, the court would issue an order of contempt. And yeah, the the court can order the police to arrest you and hold you in contempt for not complying with the court's order regarding reallocation of your resources. Yes. That's what I'm saying. The court doesn't have the authority, but it, it will it could do though. It could do it. It just doesn't have the right to do it. So how do you deal with that? Well, you try not to get in contempt, right? And a reasonable 
argument is, first of all, I, I can't comply with your order. Whether or not there's jurisdiction here, I cannot comply because I don't, I'm not the trustee and I'm not the owner of the property you're ordering me to distribute or divvy up. That's held in trust. Why do I know that? Because I said so. The property is held in trust. The beneficiary is the one asking for the property when she already has the property. So what's the judge going to say then? How can he hold you in contempt? So the family, the wife and the children are the beneficiaries of the trust yes. and not the yes. father, not the father. Well, he benefits as well, but he's also serves as trustee. So there's a fiduciary obligation and fiduciary regarding children. Yes. Okay. But how can you go to the court then and order, have the court change the agreement, change, break the trust? It's irrevocable. The trust is, is formed on the consummation of the marriage. Yeah, I didn't have to go, go to a lawyer and have a, a document written up. It already exists. And so I use the parole evidence rule to recreate the trust agreement, the material aspects of it, and demonstrate to the court that it doesn't have jurisdiction, nor does the party, like the husband, for example, have the ability to comply with the order because he doesn't have custody of the property. He doesn't have the property rights to comply with the order. Just like, for example, if the, if the judge says, I'm going to order you to, what they do is they say, we, I'm going to order you to participate in the sale of your property. So that means you're going to, I'm ordering you to sign a listing agreement with a real estate agent. I'm ordering you to order an appraisal on your property. And then I'm ordering you to sign a contract selling your property. And then I'm ordering you to split the proceeds with your, your ex-wife. Okay. Well, how can the judge do that? He can't. He's going to order you to participate. If the judge had the authority, why couldn't he just sell your house like it was a foreclosure? Because he doesn't have the authority. But here's what's interesting. I don't need to know the law to understand that if the judge says you have to sell your house because it's a divorce, and then you have to split the equity with your uh, wife when you cash out, right? Well, if that's if the judge had that authority, what authority does he have to make someone buy my house? Right. So what does that tell you? He doesn't have the authority at all. Does he have the authority to require anybody to lend me the money to refinance my house, to take the equity out? Heck no. He doesn't even have control over looking at my credit to see if I qualify. Does he have the authority to tell me to go get better credit? <laughs> I mean, you could, you could write a law that says it shall not rain on Tuesday. <laughs> Good luck with that one. You know, this is my point. So, so I'm saying this in, about the example of divorce proceedings, but I want y'all to have some language and and see how that you can look at you know think about this stuff. And I'll give you one more example. Um, there's no, it's a related case where uh, it was boyfriend girlfriend. They had a baby, young child, uh, about a year old, and it turns out that the father is just a, a maniac. He's a criminal. He's been arrested and indicted and convicted of many violent crimes in several states, <laughs> including kidnapping and threatening the lives of his newborn and his girlfriend, holding him hostage, right? So he was in jail. The state filed a petition and said, we have an agreement with the father. We want paternity to prove, right? They want evidence of paternity. And then the state alleged that it had an agreement but never produced the agreement. And the attorney went into court trying to create the agreement by speaking to the judge. And so I had my client object and file a motion to dismiss and say, there is no agreement on which the state can uh, proceed. And furthermore, any, any such agreements, because it said in the complaint that the state promised him to be released from prison if he would sign the agreement. So it's under, he signed the agreement under threat of continued incarceration. So that agreement's not valid, even if they have one. They refuse to participate in discovery. They ask for protective orders. They will fight every way they can to get discovery, kind of like in Ray's case. They don't want to talk about it, right? Keep deny delaying and delaying because there is no authority to proceed. And here's why the state was doing it. This happens to be Indiana. The state was doing it, jeopardizing the safety of the, the baby and the mom because this guy was already violent. It's already established solely for a federal funds program that Biden enacted into law. It's paying the court money to establish paternity. And then the criteria are that the father is out at not in jail or something, right? So that's why they let him out of jail. The same prosecutor that put him in jail 
let him out of jail to qualify for the federal funds program. Sick. This is why this is this is sick. We need to get rid of it. So otherwise, I wouldn't put my attention into it. And I and so this is one of those things that you know we should look at, and maybe consider in your own family having a postnuptial agreement, something that would make you responsible to handle affairs within your family. You can certainly do that. It doesn't mean you have to divorce, <laughs> you know. Um, but I'm just saying, just realize there's this evil out there. And I didn't even tell you about all the other, you know, the, the real sinister behind the scenes. You guys probably already understand that the court doesn't have the interests of your children in mind. It cannot love. It has no liability. That's another thing. The judge telling you what to do with your money for the benefit of your children, that's disingenuous at the best. Like, how, how does the judge care? He doesn't care about your children, doesn't even know them, never met them. You know, so the state's interest, the state is an insane person and it, 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 it has no moral compass. So anyways, but those those few items are so obvious, okay? Uh, and I, that's why I want to bring it up. That's how you look at these things. Um, Eric, did, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, as far as the husband's role in this relationship and his ability to breach contract by not fulfilling his obligations and not taking care of the beneficiaries in the way that was, I don't know, expected or agreed, is that uh, is that a precedent? If it's not physical abuse or neglect, um, is that a precedent? <laughs> that, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so imagine if there is a breach of fiduciary and it's the trustee. Now you have a contract issue and certainly you can go to the circuit court and get the judge to intervene in the capacity that he's allowed to. It's not a divorce proceeding. It's not a child, you know, it's a breach of contract case and it's a trust. And then the trust has to be established by a declaration of trust and an affidavit in the court because most marriages, you know, people don't write stuff. You have infinite terms in your marriage and they change all the time, you know, but the core things are established by what you do. But certainly if there is a breach of that fiduciary, the court would have jurisdiction. Yeah. Not precluding that. Same thing with abuse or neglect. You know, if there's a crime involved, certainly. But not just for a divorce because the wife wants to reallocate or the husband wants to wants to get out of his obligations. You cannot get out of your obligations as husband and father. When you when you chose that role, that's life. That's lifetime. You cannot convey your obligations. Now, of course, children can be adopted. OK, I understand all that. And, you know, parents die and things of that nature. And we definitely want the state to be involved in that in many cases. If, if the family's not big enough, sometimes you don't have close family members or people who are capable of taking over that role for you for the care of your children until they're old enough. So yeah, I'm all for the state getting involved in that, but we don't need a family court system. It's a franchise to make a profit. It's a multi-billion dollar franchise. And I think it works to mostly to the detriment of people, to the detriment of families. I think we've seen that. In fact, it, it actually encourages divorce because it's telling women you're going to get rewarded. Um, I mean, I can give you uh, plenty of examples of that, but that's a good point, Eric. You can use the court for something like that. You just if it's can't. Just a matter of a, if it's just a matter of a, of a wife saying that resources are not being properly allocated, I mean, that seems like such a massive gray area that a court would basically find um, find cause to rule in a case like that as long as the wife says, well, he didn't buy okay. me fancy things. I mean, ah, good point. So so here's what you have to understand is that the the father is the final arbiter. And his decisions are those of another judge. So there's a, an issue of collateral estoppel. Now, they would laugh at me for hearing this when I say collateral estoppel or res judicata, because every attorney is going to say, well, that judge didn't agree to that. And I don't care because the judicial power is in people. And when I have the liability, I make the rules. So you have to look at the father as being the final arbiter. So he gets the last word and you kind of have to live with that. And that's the problem. The wife doesn't want to do that. She enjoys all the other benefits. But then, you know, so, but yeah, there's, there's going to be those situations. So you're not going to, you're not going to be in that infinite situation, this infinite, you know, gray area world of he didn't buy me that dress I wanted for my birthday, you know, <laughs> that the court can't take jurisdiction over that. Boy, what a mess that would be. Um, so yeah, there, there are those things, but I think what we want to do is avoid the court stepping into a private affair, a private membership association. I mean, we have so much case law on what those are. I mean, the definition of a private membership association is by what it excludes. 
What about two brothers? It excludes everybody in the world. Husband and wife excludes everybody in the world. <laughs> That's a heck of a private membership association. So what the heck is the court doing in there, stepping in there and mess messing it up? As long as there's no, you know, crimes going on. It's always dealing with money and property, right? Property rights. Part of the property rights in the marriage, they're intangible. It's the right to make a choice. That's what the court's interfering with, your choice, your choices. And chattels, you know, things you can, you know, things in the household. So I just want to introduce those concepts and encourage you if if you want to go see it. There's some intro videos I have, and it's a course. It's a separate course, and I'm about to add about four or five more videos on the, the subject matter, but there's about a dozen right now, nine to 12, something like that in there that takes you through the different aspects. What I'd like to do is get a situation where people are starting to understand this and then consider adopting a postnuptial agreement that's in writing that's very friendly to the parties, very friendly and, and takes care of the wife and it takes care of the husband. It holds people accountable to what they're supposed to be doing in writing. And there's a there's a plan, right? There's a plan, for, for example, if, if one of the parents dies. A postnuptial agreement can handle that. Also, a postnuptial agreement can make the family property bulletproof, let's say, uh, immune from attacks from other parties. A postnuptial agreement can be part of an asset protection plan or an estate plan. It's not something that you know they portray on TV like the um, what was that movie Intoler Intolerable Cruelty with George Clooney, Catherine Jones. Remember the Massey prenup? <laughs> so it doesn't have to be like that. What do you think, Ray? That brings a thought to my mind. Would this, would this type, could this protect from domestic violence claims? Because a lot of times that's what the law does. I've seen it. They tried to pull it on me. They and do. they'll claim that you have domestic violence and they're using it to get people's guns. And they'll do that, yeah. And then there's all, so what you have to do first is when that comes up, sometimes it'll be implied. They'll try to test and see how it flies with the court. They imply it. They don't make the accusation. The one of the spouses, and so immediately you ask for an evidentiary hearing. Take evidence. Take testimony. Okay, hospital records, police records, etc. So okay. you, you have to understand that part of it. Sure, that can be used against you, but you can't act on a presumption. The court cannot act on a presumption in a pe pecuniary way. It can't penalize you until there's an evidentiary hearing. Then the court can make a referral, right, to Child Protective Services or the police. Mm -hmm. It's a tool they use because under domestic violence, whether there's any children or not, yeah, they can claim, you know, you can, they, they're trying to use it. They use, they do use it to take people's gun rights and uh, they'll yeah. conjure up. <clears throat> and you can you could do things like you can have a gun trust. There's all things you can do. You, you know you can you can head them off at that. You can you can preclude them from getting involved in that. But see, we don't think of those things. That's why I'm ha you know as I'm talking about this. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a it, this is a disaster right now. That's I, I didn't realize that was so bad. That's why I'm putting my attention to it because there are millions of people in this horrible situation. Is when I when I started talking to some people, I've got some new clients that are in the situation and it's they're telling me like every time I talk to them, they're saying, Yeah, all the people, all the guys I'm working with are having this situation. <laughs> like 80% of them. It's like a plague. We gotta stop this. So but I can't help people that are gonna be, you know, breaking the law. I can help people that are going to try to do the right thing, you know. All right. Owner, what did you have in mind? <laughs> You got to unmute yourself. I don't know. I can't unmute you. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you're if you're hypothetically in a situation, hypothetically, uh, you know, nothing, uh, nothing, nothing going on here. But um, right. would, could could you put that proposal together? That that situation to say, okay. Here's what the here's the ongoing relationship should be, and here's what I want it to be go ongoing ongoing forward, even though you're in that situation, or isn't that advisable? Yeah, anytime you want to make an agreement to get out of that situation, like let's say you're in court, first the first step should be to dismiss the case. Okay. The second step is 
work it out. And yeah, put it in writing. And it's none of the court's business. So the first step is dismiss the case or I'm not talking about anything. I'm going to fight you every two, every step of the way. I'm going to challenge the jurisdiction. I'm going to appeal every damn order you sign. I don't care what happens. You're not getting anything out of me. It's going to, if you get anything out of me, it's going to cost you four times more than what you're going to get. Until they finally figure it out that they don't have jurisdiction. All right. Well, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Clayton. Yeah. Uh, for, well, just want to say thank you. First of all, these Thursdays are becoming really amazing stuff and I'm wondering where you get all this knowledge, but I was wondering quickly if you're aware of um, how this whole marriage thing intersects with the whole like green card and immigration issue. Um, if there's any helpful knowledge you have in that domain. Okay. I do have a couple of clients in that situation and um, uh, marriage is one of the criteria in form uh, 485. If you want to check it out. So look at form I-485 for immigration visa green card applications. Okay. That's a green card application. You can, you can have your, you know, you get your visa and all this, you come over here and you can get a marriage visa. I did that. That's how, that's how my wife came over here. We got a marriage license in her home country and that qualified her. We didn't get a license here, but uh, yeah. So there are criteria. If you want to know what they are, it's pretty easy. I'm helping somebody right now do this. Um, it's in form I-485. Okay, well, help? we're married already, and I uh, and we've uh, petitioned for her for her immigration visa or whatever, but it's like a year and a half backlog, and well, the whole so thing is just then, a little bit I heard ridiculous. It was five. Yeah, well, it is ridiculous. It may be. We're still waiting. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. My, I took mine like about four and a half to get hers, so it might take that long. I talked to an attorney on that the other day, and she said it was about four to five years now. So, if it's only a year and a half, you're in good shape, I guess. What's um what is being prevented uh by not having the green card? I'm sorry, we're waiting for the visa. It's oh just the visa, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, so that's why it's not five years. Yeah, just the visa, okay. So I don't know how to speed that along. You just got to wait in line. That's how they are. Okay. Is, right. is she here in the states? No, no, no. I'm visiting. I'm actually usually living in Beijing. I'm in New York at the moment, visiting the family and stuff, and I'm going back to Beijing for a year while we wait this out. So. That's, and how that's, that's what you going. have to do. I mean, when when it, when you're dealing with international, the country has the right to pretty much do whatever it wants. Okay, you know, right. Because you mentioned that like the state sees you as an individual, and I was like, mm, that's interesting. I thought maybe that would kind of intersect there, but okay, okay, thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope that leads to a good discussion. But I can certainly do Q and A. And I had a lot of questions this week about opening accounts. That's normal. <laughs> And what to do with my LLC and things of that nature, how to interact with it. I talked to a couple th uh, today. They had, they reversed, they actually took a PMA. They made a document. I guess they bought it from somebody and they turned it into an entity and they were doing business with it, which is okay. But they didn't understand that it, it wasn't structured properly. And they were, they were basically having all the financial liability they were trying to avoid. They were incurring that. So I had them switch it around. So the LLC then encapsulates the actual property rights so that you have zero financial liability, then use the PMA in the background. So I don't know if you guys are in that situation, but generally an association is not an entity. It's not a person. It's just an association. It's your relationship to one or more people. And I like to use those because that's my method of avoiding liability because I can, uh, I can transfer the liability that one person has into a group of two or more because the two or more don't have and can't have the same liability unless they go out of their way to incur the liability. Like I'll give an example. I know I speak in general vague terms, but if I don't have a financial, uh, well, let's say I have financial obligations and let's say my brother has financial obligations and then he and I own something together and it's, in, it's encapsulated, it's memorialized in a corporation. Okay. So we each own 50%. He and I together in that corporation don't share the same liabilities we each had separately. So those liabilities are still out there, but together we don't have liability. So my financial liability does not attach to the company because he has an interest in, let's say it's undivided. It doesn't always have to be, but let's just say it's undivided. Um, so so now we're kind of like in this space where we're immune from old liabilities and going forward, we could have new liabilities. Like for example, if, if I wanted to get a commercial space for the company, for the both of us in the company name, and I go to sign a commercial lease agreement, and the landlord, the property manager says, 
all the owners of your company have to sign it, that could happen. What happens then is now we jointly have the liability to this party. And that goes around the corporate veil. So just keep that in mind. A lot of times when you're a corporation and you're you're doing business with other companies, many times they'll have you sign a contract in a way that pierces the corporate veil when you sign the contract. So be careful how you're doing that. You know, you go to the trouble of having a corporation. A lot of times people do that because they have an accountant. The accountant wants to set it up so it's easy to do the accounting. He understands all the rules. Fine. But a corporation is truly about managing risk, not accounting. So be aware quickly, that is that relevant to the marriage issue? No, that's a little bit different, but um, I'm just mentioning that as far as, you know, liability goes, but um, no, the marriage is kind of the opposite because the husband and wife are one person. It's you, it's opposite when you go into the court because the court is acting as if you're two separate parties in a contract and the court is saying, ignoring the contract and saying, here's the new contract. When at the beginning, they didn't have the authority to do that in the first place because there was no separation of parties. It was a marriage. So in that sense, it protects you. In the business world, it does not protect you. It's kind of the opposite. Eric, what do you want to say? All right. Um, I'm, I was looking on your website on Ace of Coins to schedule uh, an appointment, a consultation, and I kind of followed the what's what was said in the email to go down to like the right hand corner mm -hmm. and click on a link, and I couldn't find anything like that. I don't know if it's my browser or what, but I couldn't find that, and I'm also not sure where to look for the the introduction course with the nine to twelve. Okay. Videos. Um the the free consultation videos. Well, or I did see linked on the website. I saw two free consultation videos. But you also mentioned something about nine to 12, like a course, maybe it was a package you could purchase or something for nine to 12 videos you just mentioned. Is yeah. That... The divorcing the state is at privacyfight.io. I don't have a link to it yet. We just Privacy. released it. Right. Yeah. We just published it. So I'm still in the middle of marketing everything, but yeah, privacyfight.io. The first thing listed is going to be the divorcing the state subscription. Okay. I see it now. Okay. Yeah, and how about specific. for, for, um, for the consultation, I'm I'm at your website right now and I, I don't see it. Well, there's a place to um, book a time on the calendar. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Um, let me see if that. Let me see if I can see. It. Let me look if I can see it. Go ahead. I'm gonna look and see what do we got here. Okay. okay. Oh, that's right up there. All right. Order form. Okay. Yeah. Book ahead. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for putting that out. I gotta update a little bit. But um, yeah, I really wanted to announce the uh, privacyfight.io. We just added that subscription. It's separate from my other subscription. My other subscription is about two years of video content talking about LLCs and investing in cryptos and ta what a tax liability is and how to avoid it and manage it and these sorts of things. Um, I spoke with someone today and he had a um, somewhat of a complex business set up and only one minor change I recommended. He, he was in a... Um, a lawsuit and it was insurance an insurance claim and that's normal for his business the type of business so the one thing i recommended is that he just export the payment processing to a holding company that way his cash flow is not attachable and nothing else matters at that point that was in his case that was the only thing that was the most important so it wouldn't matter and what it comes down to is it would it would leave the claimant with the only remedy being the insurance so deal with the insurance company. Don't think you're going to come back to the company after the insurance and reach into my receivables because I don't have any. That's how I re we're going to restructure it. Again, it's property rights. And if you're interested, we're starting to do... Oh, now, I've got a, a few videos on... Um, this is a different subject. This is not out yet. Again, I just want to talk about divorce in the state, but I do have a series of videos and I'm creating a new subscription on easements, all the different aspects of those. And I'm also going over each provision of the contract and explaining how that works and playing it out to the end. So like if you want to control some real estate and find out in the end what happens in a foreclosure situation where you're using the easement to retain control of the property, I explain how that works all the way through. So it, it makes sense when you start listening, it, it makes sense. You'll, you'll see the video series. It should come out probably later this month. Um, it makes sense uh, when you hear that. Uh, even though foreclosure can take place, you can still possess the property and enjoy the property uninterrupted using the easement.
We use conservation easements. All right, well, if you guys have any questions on other subjects, definitely uh, now's the time. And um, I will, I think I'm going to publish this one on YouTube so you can um, you can see it there shortly. The other one I'm just going to keep in the private membership area from last week. I'm supposed to talk to a group about that easement, John. I'm yeah, I'm finding that I'm getting calls from groups of investors. They want to know about it. Because it started with about the farmers, about the pipeline. So I'm about yeah, those guys need a lot of help. So they I'm need to put to easements on there. Uh, there's another one I'm looking at. Uh, the energy company, I think I mentioned this last week. The energy company wants to uh, create an easement. And so what I figured was, let's just do one first. That way, it doesn't matter what they do, right? Because you imagine a big, powerful billion-dollar energy company is not going to let you stand in the way. <laughs> Who are you, right? So if we put an easement first, what, here's what here's what this comes down to. It's like in the divorcing the state. It's already a settled matter, right? The terms of the use of the property are established in, in writing, and they are a lien and a conveyance of property on the public record. That is a settled matter. Good luck trying to get a court to interfere with that. See, this is what happens with the marriage. People don't understand. They get a lawyer, they get a lawyer, and the lawyer plays along with this whole scheme, and they forget that the marriage is a settled matter. So that's another term I want to introduce. I hadn't thought about that until you asked that question, Ray. So the judge wouldn't have jurisdiction to intervene with the if there's a prior easement on the land, even though the power company right. or pipeline company would... Can't do anything. The only, the only time the judge could do anything is if there is some sort of issue of marketability or there was a conflict in the use of the property by two easements or a conflict with the owner, the, the title holder, and the easement. So the judge would you know make his decision on that, but he couldn't change it. So I'm very careful to write the easement so that it's going to survive any challenge like that. Even I the, even address the marketability of it, yeah. If the judge gets out of line, what you said earlier was very powerful. On removing the judge's immunity, you send a letter to the AG, and there's case law. You send a letter to the AG expressing the tort, yeah. removes the immunity of the judge, and there's actually case law. And then you proceed law. against them in tort. Yeah, just sue them if you have to. Um yeah, but it's not hard, guys. You just file you file a tort claim. It's in a letter expressing a tort. You send it to the proper agency. Like in Florida, it's the Department of Financial Services. How do I know that? I looked it up in the statutes. You look under the uh, State Tort Claims Act, mm -hmm. Georgia Tort Claims Act, Florida Tort right. Claims Act, California Tort Claims Act. Mm -hmm. They all got them, right? It'll tell you a slightly different procedure. The one I had was uh, recently was, um, I guess it was Wisconsin. We did one, uh, and that was uh, to the AG's office. Just a letter. Just did one in Florida. That was to the DFS. You can look it up for your state. And if you have a problem with the judge, and I'm not suggesting you do it quickly, like give him a chance. And if he's really not going to do the right thing and you know for sure it's the it's the wrong thing and it's a tort, it should qualify as a tort. Be careful. Make sure it really is a wrong that you from which you would suffer an injury that you can quantify in dollars. When you got that, Put him on notice. If he doesn't behave, yank his immunity. See how he likes that. Eric, what do you think? All right. Um, thanks for taking another question. Is it is it reasonable to ask an employer, a new employer, to pay you into an LLC for hourly wages or for like a normal job? Is there is there a reason why a large corporation or any other business wouldn't do that? Yeah, I like that. I wish they would. The accounting function would not. The CPA would tell you no, and he would say so based on rules established by the IRS. Rules. There's 20, 20 common law principles under which they classify wages. And wages, like I'll give you a couple examples. You can't escape the classification of paying wages. You can't say it's something else when it's actually wages meet the 20 common law principles. And a few of those rules are something like, uh, you show up for work every day because your boss said you have to, you follow the break schedule the boss gives you, you follow certain you know, little rules the, the boss gives you, you have to do all, that constitutes the, an employment relationship. If you're free to come and go as you please and provide services like another business would, that's not employment. But when you're in an employment and you can thank the employees, at, at, the brilliant employees at Microsoft in the 80s, that's how I learned this. I read the cases. And what happened was some 
brainiacs decided that they needed they needed wage withholding for social security i'm sure they're happy about that now they're probably 70 or something 65 but in the 80s they uh they complained and they sued microsoft i think in the us district court and they said that Microsoft was not uh, paying us as employees or paying us as independent contractors. We demand to be treated as employees. Yeah, thank you could thank them. And so uh, that alerted the IRS, and then you had all these new rules come out. I mean, that's partly why we had, not partly, it's one aspect of the change, the Internal Revenue Code of 1986. I think that was part of the deal. Now, some of that you have to attribute to the um, the doctors, the professionals. What they were doing is using real estate for no other purpose. They weren't investing with it. They were buying real estate because they were stupid, and they were using it for tax breaks. That's all they were caring about was not paying more taxes. Instead of actually investing in real estate to make money and you know make people's lives better, all they cared about was dumping the cash. They were too stupid to invest the properly. They were buying real estate and then writing off the losses on it. It's so dumb. So the government finally said, hey, there's too many of those guys doing that. <laughs> Let's change the rules, you know. So that was your internal revenue code of 86. All right. I don't see any other hands raised. Can I do another one? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, when it comes to surrendering collateral, we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, I'll just take a car, for example. Uh, you have it. It's in um, repossession status. That is just a civil matter, right? There's not a situation it is where... Civil. It's not criminal, right? Nope. So last week you mentioned that if you do not surrender that collateral, that they can report it stolen. And you said something about the the holder or the registered owner of the vehicle can be considered the um, uh, lead suspect, I think you said. If you're not the one that make the police report. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. If the lender made the police report. Yeah. And it's very unusual that, that were to, if that were to happen. It's unlikely. But mm -hmm. I have heard of it. Okay. All right. And, and surrendering that collateral, you know, the interesting thing about what actually constitute a vehicle and, you know, the things with VIN numbers on it and frames and things like that. I'm, uh, maybe we'll talk about that too later about what constitutes the surrendering of the collateral. <laughs> Why you want to part it out? <laughs> I don't want to do anything. <laughs> with, the v, with the VIN on there. Here's your VIN back. <laughs> um, I just, I just want to know what the law is so that I can act appropriately and in, in the future. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll give the car back. I mean, I've told clients before, just use the car reasonably as long as you can until it gets to that day where, you know, they're threatening you, then give it back. I mean, some people need it. I, I just say, give it back now because make your life easier. Go get another car. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So what's uh, WLPRO? Why do you give, what do you put that word over there? Now hey. I can't pronounce that. Hey John, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, Arthur. We spoke a couple of weeks ago. I don't know why, okay. but I'm using my business account, so it's really... okay. All right. Hey, how are you, man? All right. Hey, I, just a quick question for you. I, I'm just curious because I've done small claim cases before and got summary judgments against defendants because they didn't answer the claim, and yeah. I'm just wondering with these national cases going on, with like Donald Trump, Alex Jones, and other people who've had judges declare summary judgments against them without a jury trial, when obviously the Constitution guarantees every person a jury trial. Are they are they in some type of administrative court where they're getting personal and subject matter jurisdiction over them that way to be able just to declare a summary judgment? No, the rules allow it. The Constitution does not guarantee a jury trial. You have to demand a jury trial as a plaintiff, and typically right. the plaintiff like if you're going to sue Trump or one of these famous guys, you're not you're going to you're not going to demand a jury trial. If I'm the defendant, I want a jury trial because it increases the cost of litigation and it probably gives me a fair fairer chance. But the the plaintiff typically most most corporations don't want a jury trial. They want the judge to rule. So it's that it's the rules of civil procedure that govern um, juries. Not so what happens, they're not demanding jury trials. They're just going trials. right to make the determination. Right to a trial. So uh, like I was saying before, summary judgment is abused in this country and it's overused. So that's what's going on as well. It's the rules of civil procedure. You're, you're not guaranteed a trial ever. So you try to make it to trial. The way you make it to trial is you have always have unresolved material issues of fact mm -hmm. or neither party can show that he's entitled to the judgment as a matter of law without going to trial. 
the criteria for summary judgment are that there are two. Either or can prevail. If I ask the court for summary judgment, I have to show that there are no genuine issues of material fact in dispute. The other way is I can say that I'm entitled as a matter of law and I have to show. If I can do that, then I can avoid a trial. Now, yeah, if someone doesn't respond, I'd rather ask for summary judgment than a default because if I get a default judgment, then I have to prove up my case possibly. Then I, then I have to prove damages. Whereas if I get a summary judgment, whatever I ask for, I can get it. Yeah, that's what, that's what I did in small claims court. And then, yeah, uh, small claims is uh, somewhat administrative. So right. keep that in mind as well. And it's a small amount of money, smaller, 5,000, 25,000, something like that. Yeah, but, and right. keep in mind, these famous people that are in court and stuff and you see in the news, a lot of that, I, I think a lot of that's for show. It's for publicity. They're probably making money with it. Huh. Somehow, I don't know how they're making money with it, but the, the more they're in court, the more they're relevant in the news cycle, right? Right. That's that good. To Thank you so much. That's cool. Okay. Elaine, what do you think? Thank you. Um, I This is to my, my own situation. Um, I just want to make sure I understand that I must set up the New Jersey LLC for Caleb and Brown and isolate the credit card, my old credit card, before I default. Yeah, they're two separate things. So I don't have you to. Wanna... Yeah. yeah. If you want to default on a credit card, make sure that you don't also have another type of account with that institution, like Chase Bank credit card, and then you have a Chase Bank savings account. Don't default on the credit card because the bank will just take your money out of the savings account. Okay. So I don't have to worry about that as far as setting up a New, Jer New Jersey LLC. No. you're. I mean, if you're setting up the company to avoid the collection process, right, to deal with that, you're two years early. It takes about two years to get to, into the collection process, and that's if you don't do anything. I'm sorry, I don't understand. What do you mean collection process? This is well, this is for for profits that I might take from Caleb and Brown. Well, of course, but if you're not going to pay on the credit cards, they're at some point possibly going to sue you and get a judgment and try to collect on it. That takes up, upwards of a year or two years, year to two years. So you want to have a company in place so that you're managing assets and property outside of your name. So if that were to happen, uh, you're uncollectible. And you have plenty of time if oh. you're just now defaulting. So I don't have to worry about the LLC right this minute. It's no. more important to get the new secured credit card set up with a new yeah. checking account in a separate bank. Yeah. Move over to secured okay. cards while you have good credit. That's easier. And then isolate your credit accounts that you want to default on, then default on them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mm. All right, anyone else? Oh, wow, we're almost at eight o'clock. Well, I hope that um, gives you some idea you know, about jurisdiction and um, encourage you to look at my uh, Divorce in the State series. And also I have a series of videos on YouTube. You can just go watch them, just go through and you'll see Divorce in the State in different places. I Like I have several iterations of basically saying the same thing. The most recent one is a 34 minute one, okay? And uh, if, this is gonna be record, this is recorded, so uh, if you listen to it again, the phrases I'm telling you are things you can go look up and find case law on. Okay, like um, settled matters, matters that are settled, the court doesn't have jurisdiction. Uh, someone can't create a controversy over a settled matter, right? Now, let me go look at the chat here. We got quite a few. Right, let's see here. Just give me a second. All right. Um, Sorry, I got to scroll to the top. Okay, oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, divorce might start out amicably. Doesn't always end up that way, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so the court has authority, jurisdiction to hear a contract where there's an allegation that it's been breached. The court can review the contract and determine if it, in fact, has been breached and it can provide a remedy. The remedy might be in the form of a money award, a judgment awarding money. Um, the contract, well, the, the court has the power to determine that a provision in the contract is unconscionable. 
or void for some other reason. So the court does have jurisdiction over existing contracts, but the court does not have jurisdiction to ignore the contract and impose its own contractual terms between other parties. Make sense? They can't change an agreement. That Right, they can only enforce it or they can award damages for breaking it. Um, yeah. Yeah, we don't want to we don't want to encourage the insane person, the court to take care of affairs that we should be taking care of. Yeah. yeah a lot of times we, we use the word corrupt and yeah, there is corruption, but I think sometimes we can head that off by actually taking responsibility and, and doing doing something like even though I, I know how to do this, go to court and so forth and sue people. I try not to. I really would try to work so, uh, work things out, and lots of times I'm able to do that just by you know communicating, communicating. So. Yeah. Does that okay? So did that? So does that answer your question? Uh, on the okay on the summary judgment, I covered. I think I covered that pretty well. All right. Just interrupt me if I didn't. Uh, line one or Martin. Yeah, Martin Armstrong. I know that guy. I know of him. Uh, smart guy. I didn't know he was in contempt for seven years. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you already, if you've already had a cons consultation with me and you paid for it, what I like to do is, if you want to have a follow up consultation about the same thing, I, I like to not charge you for that, and I'd rather just not charge you. I don't want to, you know, credit you or reverse the charges. So, if you would, please. I know it takes a bit, but. Send over an email to me and ask for the code. I'll give you the code so that you don't have to pay for the call on the second time around. And, and when I do a consultation, I assume that I'm going to talk to you two or three times. It's not a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to, Clayton, I'm just going to say about the ecclesiastical aspect of the court. Just look at it. Compare how the courtroom appears to a church. Now, that's not why I, I thought that way, but then if you go look at the way the statutes are written and the rules of civil procedure, if you look at the book form, it looks like the Bible. Then if you look at the fact that the officers of the court, officers, they speak in the third person. This is unique to the court system. They follow a strict set of rules, and many of the um, things that are done by lawyers, by attorneys, are ceremonial. It's hard for us to see that. They don't portray that on TV, but there are things that the attorneys do in court to show deference to the judge. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that it's ecclesiastical in nature. Um, and judges, okay, so if, if I've sued judges before, it's not that I ever sued them and won and got some money. I made my point though and got what I needed for my client, okay? Now, lately... I'm actually just pulling their immunity. I'm doing it very fast. I'm not waiting around. I'm not arguing with them. I'm pulling their immunity and bringing them right into to, uh, a tort claim. So I'll tell you how that uh, plays out. My hope on that is that they start doing the right thing. I don't care about getting money out of judges. Um, yeah, so if you're earning wages and your employer decides that he's going to pay as an independent contractor, just make sure that your contract is that of an independent contractor, that it's not considered a wage earner or employee. And even if it is, you could probably get away with it, right? As long as you're not audited and scrutinized, just realize if you're a wage earner at some point, you know, maybe the, maybe the IRS will, uh, will change how you reported it, penalize the employer. So that happens. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah. If you want to read the U S code, what you do is you go to the uh, law library and you start with volume one of the U.S. Code. And we'll check back in with you in about 300 years, okay? When you get to title 50, let us know what you think. <laughs> Someone's asking me, Clayton, if you want to read the U.S. Code. Yeah, man, it's it's a monster. Um, I've read big parts of it. I've never read the entire thing. I could tell you what some of the volumes are for. I've, they're very useful. Um, what you might want to find, though, is go to a specific provision in the code one title that deals with something. Remember, it's all federal. U.S. Code is federal. Uh, and read the shepherdized version or the annotated version of the U.S. Code. There's even the U.S. Code annotated, the USCA. All right. The reason why you do that is because you'll see the statute is dry, boring reading, and maybe it doesn't make sense. It's very complex. These people that wrote this stuff are extremely intelligent people, I hate to say, but they are. 
they have good high reading comprehension skills, okay? So they write these statutes. It's not just one person that writes them. Literally hundreds of people write these statutes. Law professors write these statutes and they they whittle them away for years, months at least, months. And then they enact them. Now we're left with reading them in, in one sitting, okay? So what I recommend is look at the annotated version of the code of the statutes and it'll help you understand what is being done there. The court is interpreting that. So if that helps you, no, don't sit there and read the whole code. By the way, uh, if I could put the entire U.S. code on a big wall of my house, the implementing regulations for each of the agencies that those, those code sections apply to would fill the house itself. So the code is just part of it. All right. Can I offer a suggestion for the code? What's that about the code? Um, so what I started doing is getting PDF versions of the code and putting it in a private AI server so that you can just ask it questions. And it Girl, will... Brilliant. Yes, that's a brilliant way yeah. to do it. We should talk about that more. You're probably better suited to talk about it than I am. But I wanted to make using... a service, and you're the only one I know that I would really partner with on that. Let's but do it yeah. because we're using AI right now to write some briefs. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm free tomorrow if you want to have a call. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, no, certainly. Good. All right. Good idea. We should talk about that more. I'm I'm actually incorporating AI into the service we're providing. So uh, we actually have a whole team of people that, just a few people right now, but it's a team of people that are already trained, been working with them for a couple of years now, and we're starting to use AI in the casework. So I think that's way more effective than just hiring people and training them and hoping they do the right thing. We know what to do, and we have, we use the AI as a tool. And when we deliver a brief, now the other side doesn't realize they're fighting a hundred years of law professors. Yeah, <laughs> that's what the AI does. That. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. A private AI service, not a public. Okay. Yeah, as long you, as you don't have wanna... access to all the data. Right. Yeah. Okay, so employment service companies. That's a good question, Jay. Employment service. So let's say, for example, if I were to buy, I have to, I look at it in terms of how I'm going to invest, run a business, buy a business, or, or do something and avoid certain liabilities. So if I buy uh, a, a storage business, right, where people just store their stuff that won't fit in the garage, right? I love that type of real estate because you only have a few front end employees that operate the gates and so forth and answer customer questions. Um, those people I would outsource to an employment agency and I would lease them back. And so I would just say, say you can look on Indeed, but also I would search the internet with search terms for um, employee leasing, okay? Employee leasing. That's that's what you want to do. Thanks, John. I appreciate <laughs> hey, it's that. It's good, man. That no was... question is too weird. That's uh, that's where we left off in the last uh, chat on the Telegram was like, because we're definitely at that point right now. We have to come up with a, a war plan okay. um, with uh, restructuring given kind of what's happened this year and how things are going to be evolving forward. I would like to, I'm going to schedule in a, a consultation with you to kind of go a little more detail on some other things that we've come across Okay, sure. um, and some thoughts yeah. as far as how to, how to, how to get, how to play this out moving forward. Cause we only got until 2024 until the new uh, corporate transparency act kicks in. So <laughs> I kind yeah, of want to sure get how everything. That's play out. I'm not, I'm not too interested. I don't care. But yeah, there's gonna it's gonna be interesting to talk about that. I'm not concerned about it, but it will be interesting. Yeah, there's gonna be some things to deal with. Yeah, it's because like they'll want all LLCs to be with their FinCENs, and it's like I know I got two LLCs for you, and then I got my core business right now. Um, so it's just a uh, I just want to play this thing out and make sure everything is everything looks kosher uh, moving forward with uh, different um, different strategies that I've been, been yeah. discovering. I'll look for that and uh, look forward to that conversation. And I always learn things too. When you guys ask me questions, uh, Javis is asking me, what if an attorney signed your name on a contract because he couldn't find the original? Yeah. Well, that sounds this, like incompetence. It's, it's a, it's a car contract. Um, I can just turn on video. On. Well, look, it's, you're the only one that can authenticate your signature. So what you do is if you didn't sign it, what you simply do is you provide an affidavit stating that that's not your signature, that you never executed that instrument. Now you got a okay. forgery, but you got to do an affidavit. Okay, I I, I submitted so I an abatement. About it, but just yeah. judge okay, by we can talk now. tomorrow about it. Yeah, we can talk about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's see. Later in the morning would be ideal. Yeah. There, okay. Statute limitations on fraud. Okay. No, let's say no. 
but there are conditions where you can no, can no longer uh, accuse someone of fraud. Um, what would that be? Maybe you had a, a hand in it or something, or maybe you were negligent. There, there's there's weird conditions, but presumably sta uh, fraud is not limited by statute. But it, it does, an important factor in it is when the fraud was discovered. That is important. And and then the other factor is what steps you took, did you whether or not you acted diligently. That 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 could be defense. So I guess maybe a better answer to your question, Elizabeth, is if you were to look at what the defenses were would be for a civil action for fraud. What are my defenses? Then you would see possibly there may be something like that, statute of limitations. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. It was a it was about 10 years ago and I just dropped it because I was so frustrated that I was up against this organization that was supposed to be a fiscal sponsor okay. for, a, for a project and um, they dissolved and didn't tell me and they took 13,000 that I, that was. Okay. Well, the, the owners, the board of directors or whoever had an interest in the company are still liable to you collectively, jointly and severally. Let's call it that way. Right. Cause I'd have to find out who the board was, who the bank, you know, I'm sure the banking records are available somehow to see what happened to the money. I, I well, talked to could... the executive director and he's like, oh, you know, you know, it's not my fault. You know, I left a long time ago. And I said, well, we had the agreement. We had the agreement that you were going right. to, you know, keep well, that. You would sue me. them each collectively. You would just name them each in the as defendants. Mm -hmm. And then you would explain in your statements of fact what happened. That's how you uh -huh. would proceed if you're going to use the court. I see. Yeah, it's, it's somewhat cumbersome, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah. And on the oath of office, I, I don't ask, I don't need the judge's oath of office. It's presumed he's taken an oath, right? It's presumed he's going to fulfill his mandate. I don't care about his oath, but if he's not going to do the right thing and he's going to commit a tort while, while in that position, I could yank his immunity. And all I have to do is express the tort and serve notice on the proper office. Sometimes it's the chief judge and the attorney general's office. Sometimes like in Florida, it's the department of financial services. And I always include the chief judge anyways. Sometimes it is the chief judge that's doing it. You still got to serve it on the chief judge. <laughs> so yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, I mean, you can get their bonds. I mean, I, that's what I was telling you guys. There's all these people talking about all this stuff you can do. I'm just like, keep it simple. What are you doing? Do you want a remedy? Here's the fastest way to do it. Yank his immunity. Give him a chance and you can yank it. How do you yank their immunity? Do you just express that verbally? Your immunity no, you is gone. You have to send a written notice to the correct office expressing the the tort. Uh, it probably should be a tort. I don't know if you can do anything else, but you would have to serve notice of the claim, make a claim, on the proper office. And the reason why you do that is because you're serving the risk manager, like general counsel or something. The general counsel for the entire state is the attorney general's office. Right. So if you're going to do that to a corporation, you would serve that notice on the general counsel for the corporation. Okay. That makes sense. Got it. So a new wage earner, Haymon's Freedom Law School to claim that filing returns is not mandatory. What are you going to do? I don't like what Paymon does. He creates all these arguments and paperwork. It's ridiculous. Don't do it. I told him a long time ago. I've known him since 2001. And I kept telling him, man, you're the smartest guy I know on this tax stuff. And you're wasting everybody's time with all this paperwork. You don't need all that. Either something is or it isn't. If you have wages, you're you have wages. You're not going to get out of it. No one's going to change the accounting function for you. You can't argue with anybody. And I have to tell you, I know because I that was one of my first cases I tried on myself. <laughs> and I learned, right? When you lose, you learn. So I could tell you right now, don't waste your time on it. If it's wages, it is. So yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate y'all being on the call. I know we're at the hour. Um, so thank you so much for the questions. And I hope this helps. I hope it's good information for you. I will I'll publish this on YouTube shortly. Probably show up in the morning. Great right, call, John. Thank you. Enjoy uh, your weekend. Hey, glance at that affidavit title if you get a chance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll check it out. Thanks, John. All right. Good night. Good night. Great call.